Hey, hi, hello and welcome to yet another video. It's been a couple of weeks, but we're back with a whole bunch more goodness in the iOS world. So I've been scrolling through Dribbble and I found a few designs that I think would be really nice to implement in SwiftUI. And one of them is this onboarding design. So I thought let's build this and animate the mask to make it look a little bit more alive and animated. Also give it a bit more life and more modern. So we're gonna jump straight into Xcode and see how we can build something like this. Now, of course, the first thing you wanna do is start off with an Xcode project and an empty file. And we've got our preview here on the right so we can see what we're building. And we're going to start off by creating the layout. So we'll start off with the image, the title and the subtext. And I'll show you how to do the bottom pagination looking style. So the first thing we wanna do is start off with a VStack. I'm going to pop in an image that I downloaded from the internet. I've popped that in the assets. And I'm just referencing that here. And of course we wanna make our image resizable. Then I want to add an aspect ratio and say I want it to fill the view. And then we can add a frame. Now, before we add the width or the height, I wanna wrap this in a geometry reader so that way I can actually get the screen's width correctly. So I'll just grab the VStack, I'll pop it inside the geometry reader, and then I'll say the max width is going to be geometry.size.width, and then I'll actually add an aspect ratio after that, and I want that to be 0.75 and fit. And that'll make sure that our image is actually scaled to around like three quarters, so three by four. So then I wanna add the clipped modifier so that anything that goes beyond the bounds is clipped. Then I'll add a spacer below the image and then create another VStack where we're going to hold our title and our subtext or the content text. So let's start off with basic text, say hello, and then add another piece of text underneath. And you can put any text in here. And I'm just going to add a bunch of text like this. I do wanna pop a spacer underneath so that I can push the text from the bottom upwards. And I do want some space from the top. So let's add a spacer on top as well. So we've got a bit of space from the top and some space from the bottom here. I can then style my text. So I'm going to add a foreground style of gray. And then I'll change the text here like this. And I actually want to interpolate the text here. So I actually want two pieces of text and I want them styled a bit differently. So this will say, just ask. So then for this one, I want to add a foreground color of orange. And for the entire thing, I want to add a font of title. And then I also want to make it bold. And now we have larger bold text, like just like that. And inside my VStack, I'll add some spacing. Yeah, eight, maybe we'll make it 12 even. And then just underneath this, we're going to add the pagination pills. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to create an H stack. And inside that we'll say for each zero up to the number, let's say five, I'll make it including five and we'll just capture the index. And then I'm going to add a capsule, give that a fill of color black. And of course we wanna make sure that we identify each of these items with backslash dot self. And now we have a bunch of these pills down here. Then what we wanna do is make sure we give each of them a frame. The width we're going to say, if the index is equal to zero, then the width is going to be say 10. Otherwise it'll be four. Or let's go with 10 maybe, and then it'll be 20. And then of course we want the height to be something like four. There we go, that looks a lot better. So if I zoom out, you can see this is what it looks like. And then you can also add and then you can also add a conditional modifier here. So if I wanted to say like index equals zero, then it's black. Otherwise it would be say like gray. And I can show you that this is the main one that's selected right now. I think five is too many. So let's just make it up to like four. And then of course I want to add a spacer underneath this just to push everything back up. And now we have the general UI set up for us to start adding the animation and the cool effects. Now the way we're going to make something like this work is using the canvas. So we're actually going to use the canvas to render a bunch of circles and then animate those circles into different positions. Now there's actually a really cool way to get that liquid style blob effect. So sort of like a metallic liquid where it looks like a, a drop is sort of like pulling from another one. The way we do that is by actually adding a blur onto each of the views that we're rendering. And then we add an alpha threshold so that there isn't any transparency throughout the blur. And essentially what that ends up doing is it ends up blending and merging the blurred areas and creating that liquid effect. So we're gonna go ahead and create our canvas and then we'll draw our circles in the canvas to give that effect. We'll start off with one main circle that creates the entire shape of our mask. And then we'll have a bunch of other circles that start floating around. 
So to do this, we're going to add a mask onto our image and then the mask is going to have a canvas. The canvas takes a context and a size. Now, before we start drawing the circles into the canvas, I do want to create a few variables that we're going to use in the canvas. Let's start by creating an array of all the circles positions. And to make our lives a bit easier, we're also going to declare the center height and the center width. We'll create a ball count variable, an alpha threshold and a blur radius. We'll use all of these inside our canvas, but it's a lot easier if we declare all of these variables and it's a lot easier to change and make it more dynamic. So our center width is going to be UI screen dot main dot bounds dot width divided by two. And then we're going to do the same thing for our center height. And this will be height. We'll then create a private state variable called positions. And this is going to be an array of CG points. So this will be the positions of each of our circles within the canvas. I then also want to declare a frame size also as a private state variable. This will be CG size and I'm going to initialize it to zero. You'll see where we use this later on in the video. The final three variables that I want to create is the blur radius, the alpha threshold and the ball count. I'm going to start off with a blur radius of 10, alpha threshold of 0.2 and a ball count of 5. You can actually play around with these and modify these values to see what you think looks best for the app you're trying to build. And then the last thing before we start rendering our circles is to create an initializer that initializes the positions array. So it looks like this. In our initializer, we say self.positions equals to an, an array repeating the value zero for our ball count. So this will create an array of size ball count and each element within that array will have value zero as a CG point. So now we have an array of five positions or initialized to zero. That means all of our balls are going to start at zero, zero. Let's jump over to our canvas and start rendering these circles. We're going to say let circles equal to zero up to our ball count. And then I'm going to map those. And what we want to do is we want to retrieve the tag. Then from our symbols, we'll say context dot resolve symbol with ID tag. Now what's actually going to happen is we're going to add the symbols here and this is where we're going to create our circles. And so what's going to happen in our canvas is our canvas is going to then resolve each of the symbols for a specific tag. You'll see how this works as we progress. So now that we've created all of the circles, we're going to say context dot add filter and it's going to be alpha threshold and the minimum will be the alpha threshold that we declared earlier. So alpha threshold there. We're then going to add a blur. So we'll say context dot add filter again and this will be a blur filter and the radius will be the blur radius we also declared earlier on. Now, the last thing we want to do is draw our circles in that context. So we'll say context dot draw layer and then we're just going to say context two so we don't get them mixed up. Then here we're going to say circles dot for each circle and then we want to draw our circles at the center of the view. So the way we're going to do this is say context to dot draw and select the one that says image at and then we'll add our circle and the CG point that we we're going to use is size dot width divided by two. And for the Y, we're going to say size dot height divided by two. And that'll draw our circles in the center of the view. So in the canvas, we're adding the filters and saying where we want to position them. But in our symbols, we're going to actually define how we're going to draw these. So what we want to do is say for each, and I want to iterate over the positions dot indices. And of course, make sure we have our ID backslash dot self. I'm going to say ID in, and then I'm going to create a circle. Now the circle is going to have a frame because it is a circle. We only need the width because of course it is a one by one and I'm going to have a conditional width. The first circle is going to be the main circle that creates the entire frame mask. And then the remaining circles are going to be the smaller ones that are positioned and floating around. So we're going to say ID equals zero. And if the ID is equal to zero, then we're going to say geometry dot size dot width. And we're going to subtract from this the blur radius divided by our alpha threshold. And the reason for that is because the blur radius sort of extends when you have the blur, it extends beyond the edges. So we kind of want to remove that. Otherwise, our view is actually going to extend beyond the views width. And for every other circle, we're going to say that the width for this is going to be geometry dot size dot width divided by two. So this will be just half the width. We can basically create any size that we want, but I'm just going to go with this for now. Then so we can retrieve these in the section up here where we resolve based on a tag. I'm going to add a tag to each of these circles and say tag 
and pass in the ID. Then to be able to determine where these circles are going to sit within the canvas, I'm going to add an offset and then use our positions. So this is where the positions come in. We're gonna say offset, add the X and the Y. And then if the ID is equal to zero, then we're going to return zero. Otherwise, we're going to return positions at index ID dot X. And I can just grab this and throw that into the Y section as well, and then just change that to Y. I'll just clean this up real quick so it's easier to read. And there we have it. Now I realize we had a small issue here. And actually, if you go to line 38, where we create our canvas and the circles, I had ball count instead of positions count. So you do want to go ahead and change that to positions count. We're actually trying to access an index that was out of range. Now the funny thing you want to add to see the circles moving is actually to grab this code here that you have in the initializer and go all the way down to the bottom of our view. We want to add an on appear and inside the on appear, we want to add that code into here. So we want to initialize when our view appears. Now it looks good. We have our circle, but we can't actually see the other ones moving around. And the reason for that is we don't actually have anything to trigger this animation or tell them to change their position. So what we're going to do is create a timer and the timer is going to iterate every couple seconds or so, and then add or change the positions of each of these balls with an animation. So then when you have a new position for that circle, we just animate to that position and it looks like they're floating around. I actually went ahead and wrote some code to generate a random position. So I'm going to paste that in here and run through that with you. So this code here, I've called it random position and I've said in bounds. So I actually give it a certain bounds that the position can be generated within. Obviously don't want it to go too far to the left, right, up or down. And then also the ball size. We have an X range. So this is a range of the ball width divided by two up to the bound width minus the ball size. So this keeps it within the space of the ball. And then also it doesn't let the ball go the full width, which is why we use width on two. And I do the same thing for the Y range. Then I just create a random X within that range and a random Y within that range as well. I create a center point based on that. And then because we're working with offsets, I actually want to get the offset. So I essentially grab that position minus the center. And that's because we've added the offset modifier, not a center modifier, for example. Then I return the CG point that gives back the offset X and offset Y. So once we go to the top of our file, we're going to say let timer equal to timer dot publish. And we'll say every and give it a time interval. I'm going to say I want it to publish every five seconds and it'll be on the main run loop. And it's also going to have the common mode. I'm going to auto connect this. And I then want to make sure that I receive on run loop dot main. Then now that we have our timer, we're going to go ahead to the end. We're going to say on receive of our timer. And then we want to perform. We'll just leave this here. And then we're going to say with animation. And I want the animation to be an ease in out. The duration will be seven seconds. Then inside this animation, we're going to say positions equal to positions dot map. And then just grab the random position in here because we're not actually going to use that position. And we're going to say random position in frame size. And then the ball size is just going to be an initialized width and height. And then for the ball size, we actually want to use the geometry from the geometry readers. So I'm just going to cut it from here. And then I'm going to add it at the end of the V stack like this. And then I'll be able to access the geometry dot size dot width divided by two. I'm just going to copy this, paste that and put it in here as well. And then finally, to get these moving, we want to actually declare the frame size. So we're going to go into our on appear and our frame size. We also want to use the geometry reader. So I'm going to grab that and put that inside here as well. And that's going to be equal to an initialize of that as well. The width is going to be geometry dot size dot width. And then for the height, I'm going to say geometry dot size dot width divided by 0 0.75, because if we go back up here, our actual image aspect ratio is that height. So let's rebuild our preview. And there we have it. We see that we have our mask over here. And then you can see that the balls are, have actually started to move. You can pretty much add anything else that you want to this. Like one of the things that I did was also add a shadow. A shadow looks pretty cool. Once you add the shadow to that, it makes it pop a little. You can also change the duration, play around with all of this to get the desired aesthetic that you want for the app. 
that pretty much wraps up this video and shows you how to build a really cool animation for your landing pages or any of your onboarding flows, pretty much anywhere else in your app. If you enjoyed this video, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, or if you wanna see other videos, different styles, or more content like this. Don't forget to leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe so you can see more content, and I will catch you in the next video. Peace. I don't care about your stories, I don't care about